Omema and Bill were married just a matter of days after they first met. But less than a month later, police were conducting a full search of the house. Inside, they found a deep fat fryer that had a pair of human hands inside of it and that they had been thoroughly cooked. Police would later hear the words, quote, It's so sweet, it's so delicious, I like mine tender. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. This show is made from various source documents listed in the show notes. I use news archives, documentary footage and court documents, and so the episodes are accurate to the source materials I can find. You can find all episodes as YouTube and podcast versions in the description box down below. Omeima Nelson was born in Egypt in 1968, and her and her mother were subjected to horrific bouts of emotional, physical and sexual abuse. Omeima's mum tried for years to leave her husband, but, as is so often the case in abusive relationships, it took some time, and it wasn't actually possible to leave until Omeima was a little bit older. She and her mum moved to Cairo, where life was really hard for them. They barely made ends meet, but by the time Omeima was into her late teenage years, she had met a man who she fell in love with and thought could change her whole life. The man was over in Cairo with work. He was an oil worker from America, and when his job finished, he didn't want to leave Omeima. The two were in love, and so he proposed to her, and soon after, they got married. This meant that Omeima left Cairo and went to the US to live with her husband. It looks as though she left in 1986, and so that would have made her 18 years old. Unfortunately, though, the relationship didn't last. Now, Omeima was in the US, she was alone, she was unable to speak fluent English, she could speak a little bit and was learning more and more every day, but by no means was life easy for her. And in fact, her lack of fluent English meant that she was finding it really hard to gain regular and consistent employment. And so that's when she started staying with men that she was dating. And there are a number of reports that I read that said that she used these men to stay with and sort of sustain herself while she was living in the US and not able to... Uh, find a permanent job. So she was going from man to man and she would move all over the country so that she could do this. To her, she didn't have any ties to anywhere specific in the US, so she really could go wherever was needed. Because of this, she ended up moving all around before eventually settling in California. And while she was there, she did actually pick up a couple of jobs. She worked for a little bit of time as a nanny and she also worked as a model as and when she could get that work. And while she was doing this, she was living in California and she met this man called Bill Nelson. Bill was 56 years old and he'd previously worked as a pilot, but he got into some trouble with the law back in 1984. So just two years before Omeima had moved over to the US. At that time, Bill had been convicted of smuggling marijuana. He ended up serving a four-year prison sentence before eventually being released on parole. It was after that that he got a job working at a mortgage company. He'd become accustomed to living life a certain type of way, and even after those four years behind bars, he wanted to continue his luxury life. And he couldn't really have this big hot shop job of flying a plane anymore, so he figured he would just get a more, quote, normal job. And this normal job led to him actually running his own company in mortgage lending. He got some experience in that previous company and then quickly set up his own so he could earn more money. And because of this, he really was able to continue with that lifestyle that he'd built up. He had a lot of flashy cars, he had a lot of areas of land, and he had numerous houses. And so after he'd achieved all of these material things, he then started thinking that he needed a woman by his side, someone who he could, quote, show off. And that is when, in 1991, he met Omeima in a bar. The pair struck up a conversation, and Bill was really known for flashing his money and buying drinks and it is likely that he bought Omeima a drink and then another drink and it was said that the pair were seen playing um, a, a game of pool and their conversation just continued through the rest of the night. They got to know each other more and more. Now Bill was 56 years old so he's a full 33 years older than Omeima and he's got children from a previous relationship. But he told Omeima this and she seemed to accept it no problem. She didn't mind the children, she didn't mind the age gap. And the pair got on so well, 
in fact, that they actually ended up getting married after just a few days. And I did try and corroborate that because that is so, so quickly. Um, but that's true. It really was just a couple of days that they'd known each other before they tied the knot and got married. Obviously, this had all gone incredibly quickly. And so Omeima hadn't met any of Bill's family. Obviously, Bill couldn't meet her family because her mum was still over in Cairo. But um, in terms of her meeting his family, that was possible. It just hadn't happened yet because of how quickly this relationship had progressed. And so for the honeymoon part of their relationship, straight after the wedding, they decided to spend that time going to where Bill's family was at and meeting various members of the family. See, at this point, they'd heard about Amema, but they hadn't actually met her. And so that honeymoon period took them all over. It took them to Texas and mainly Arkansas as well. And then in early December 1991, just five weeks after the couple had first met, Bill's workplace reported him as missing. He hadn't come into work on the Monday and it had been a long weekend. He'd actually um, left work on the Wednesday and was planning to be off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. But by the time Monday came and he didn't j turn up, he didn't call in, bearing in mind he runs this place. So as far as his employees are aware, he's supposed to be coming in and, and doesn't. It's completely out of character and they're really worried pretty much straight away on that Monday morning. They try and call him, no one answers. They try and call family members and no one knows where he's at. And so that is when they report him as missing. Meanwhile, across town, a phone call is made to 911 from a man called Jose Esquivel. Now, this man, Jose, is claiming that there's a woman that he knew, he had dated for a little bit of time around a year ago. He claimed that this woman had come to his house out of the blue and asked him to do her a favour. And that favour was getting rid of a man's body. Jose told officers that he'd been at his house minding his own business when he'd heard this knock at the door. And Jose had pulled back the curtain and looked out and seen this red sports car that was now sat in his driveway. This sports car he didn't recognise. He had no idea who could be knocking at his door. And so he decided to just ignore it, go back into his bedroom and just wait for that person to go away. And the person knocked and continued knocking, but eventually with no answer, they had no choice and they did leave. But this mysterious person returned a little while later. And this time, Jose decided that he was gonna answer the door. When he opened the door, he was surprised to see that Omeima was stood on the other side. He hadn't seen Omeima in months and months. And remember, the pair had only dated briefly the previous year. But Amema was stood in front of him and she cut straight to the point. She said she needed his help. She told him outright that she had killed her husband and she needed help in disposing of his body. She pleaded with him saying that it wasn't her fault and there was in fact a very, very good explanation for this deadly act that she'd committed. Amema said that they hadn't been married very long, but at the beginning, things between her and Bill were magical. They were incredible. Everything seemed to be going perfectly. She said that after they returned home from their honeymoon, Bill had seemingly changed. She said that she had seen this violent side to him and he had began to, in her words, physically and sexually abuse her. And on top of that, she then um, pulled back her sleeves and showed Jose different bruises and cuts that she alleged her husband had inflicted on her. She said that he would beat her often and would rape her whenever he wanted to. Then Omema said on the evening of, of what was Thanksgiving, she was in the apartment that she shared with Bill and he had attempted to rape her once again. But when that didn't work, he put his hands around her throat and attempted to strangle her. Omeima said she grabbed for something nearby, anything she could grab onto, and she managed to get hold of a lamp, which she brought down on him, knocking him off of her, and then pulling a pair of scissors out that she had nearby, 
dropping the lamp and then using the scissors to stab him multiple times. She had then driven straight round to Jose's house. That was the order of the events that she said had happened. And when she got round to his house, she offered him a huge amount of money. It's reportedly, um, it was $75,000. And remember, this is back in the early 1990s. She offered him that money if he would help dispose of Bill's body. Now, Jose did agree, but realistically, he just wanted her to go. He told Omeima that he would do it. She just needed to go back to her apartment and he would get everything ready and together in order to dispose of Bill's body. Omeima agreed, but as soon as Jose saw Omeima get into her car and drive off into the distance, he picked up the phone and he called the police. To be fair, this woman has called a guy that she barely knows. She hasn't seen him in about a year and obviously she is desperate but she's also clearly not thinking straight or maybe maybe she's just that arrogant to think that this person who she doesn't really have any connection with maybe she thinks she really can persuade him to do what she wants either way in this case she was wrong and Jose gave over all the information he had on Amema to police and that is when they uh, put out a search for her. They knew from Jose's description that she was driving Bill's car and so they put out a search for Bill's car and they did manage to track it down. The officer approached the car and saw that Omeima was sat in the driver's seat and curiously on the seat next to her were bags of what was later discovered to be human body parts. The officers who had pulled her over did manage to get Omeima to get out of the car and that's when they asked who these body parts belonged to and if they were in fact her husband's as Jose had said. But Omeima said no. She said that Bill was just away, he'd gone on some kind of a business trip, he was alive and well. But yes, these were human body parts. She said she knew it looked bad but this wasn't her fault and in fact it was her husband Bill who had murdered this person and then demanded that she help get rid of the body. Obviously the police did not believe her for one second and in fact they just arrested her there and then and because of all of this that was going on including finding body parts in the car they managed to get a warrant pretty much straight away to search her house and once they were inside they were met with an absolutely horrific scene. It's actually probably one of the worst, um, one of the worst crime scenes that I have researched on Red Realm. And bear in mind, I've done over 120 episodes, so it is pretty freaking bad. On entering the apartment, it was clear that Omeima had been in the middle of this like major cleanup operation, but she hadn't done a very good job at all. The bed sheets that were originally white had been taken off the bed, but they were now stained with blood and actually looked like they were more supposed to be more of a red colour. And the actual bed itself, the bed frame, had the posts broken. And when investigating officers carried on and continued through to the bathroom, that is when they found Bill's torso hanging up over the bathtub and it was skinned and the bathtub itself was full of human flesh. They also found a iron, a clothes iron, that had pieces of um, human tissue and blood and hair stuck to it. They assumed that this was probably the murder weapon. As officers continued through the house, they went into the kitchen and they saw there were numerous pots and pans all around the kitchen, but on further inspection, it became clear that inside those pots and pans, there were parts of Bill's body that Amema had cut up, placed inside and started to cook. And this included the deep fat fryer, which had both of Bill's hands inside it and they had already been cooked as well. Omeima said that she did this to remove his fingerprints. There was more human flesh found in the outside bins and that was mixed up with leftover turkey from Thanksgiving dinner and it was said that it was done, they were mixed together to sort of disguise it as poultry. Whilst they were still in the kitchen, one officer opened up the freezer and that is when they had found Bill's head. The officer could tell that the head had been deep fried because of the char marks that it had on it. And this was obviously done before it was put in the freezer. Up to this point, although they had their suspicions about the body parts they had found belonging to Bill, 
Amema was at the police station and she was still insistent that these body parts belonged to someone else, someone she didn't know. All she knew, she said, was that Bill had killed this person. But now, with this discovery of Bill's head, it was blindingly obvious that he was, of course, the victim and there was just no way she could deny it. At first, Omema stuck to the domestic violence story, claiming that she'd done this as a way to protect herself. But then she quickly changed her story to insisting that she heard voices. They were demon-like voices and they had told her to chop up Bill and place his various body parts in um, pans and then cook them. And she would later say that this was the voice of her ancestors speaking to her. A post-mortem was conducted on Bill's body parts, but it proved quite difficult because although there was ample evidence at the crime scene and also in Bill's car, by the time they'd gathered all of the remains, they realised that there was actually over 100 pounds of flesh that they just couldn't find. It was still missing. And when the police had spoken to Amema about this, they had questioned her. She said that she didn't know where it was. She hadn't done anything with it. Now, simultaneously, they were questioning neighbours, seeing if they'd heard anything or seen anything. And a number of neighbours said that on Thanksgiving night, they had heard the rubbish disposal going for around three hours. But as it was Thanksgiving, they didn't really think anything of it. Officers assumed then that it was highly likely that's how a lot of the body parts that were missing had been disposed of. What the post-mortem did determine, though, was that Bill had suffered a fractured skull, pointing to the likelihood that that iron that had been found um, at the crime scene was the murder weapon. It was also found that Bill had ligature marks on his ankles, meaning that he probably was tied up, although it wasn't clear whether this was pre or post mortem. They also found that he had been castrated and disemboweled sometime after he was killed. The case went to trial around a year later at the end of 1992. The defence made the claim that Amema was a domestic abuse victim, and they said that on the day of the murder, she had been tied up to the bed, the bed that the couple shared. And they said that she had been there for a number of days before she finally was able to slip out of her restraints. She managed to slip her arms out of the rope and then untie her own um, ankles, which had also been tied up. And after that, in a state of panic, she just grabbed the iron and bludgeoned him to death. Importantly, in self-defence, she said she feared for her life. She said that he was lying on the floor, dead, and that's when she began um, stabbing him with those scissors. But that is the last thing that she remembers. After that, she said she blacked out and she had no memory of the actual um, dismemberment or any of the cooking of his body parts. A psychological assessment determined that Omeima had PTSD and that she was also experiencing signs of psychosis, adding that Amema had admitted to chopping up Bill's body so that she wouldn't have to meet him in the afterlife. The prosecution brought a huge amount of evidence to their argument. They did agree that there was the possibility of a domestically abusive relationship. We know that Amema had those um, cuts and bruises on her that she showed Jose. Although the prosecution stated that these could, of course, have come from any kind of a struggle that happened when Amema had killed Bill. But on top of this, we know that the bedpost had been broken and this would fit with Amema having been tied up and restrained. Although we also know that Bill's ankles had restraint marks on them. So either way, it was really hard to prove what had gone on there. The prosecution presented that Bill was the one that had been tied up. They theorised that it was all part of a consensual sex game or what had started as a consensual sex game. As part of this, he had had both of his wrists and ankles tied to the bedposts. They said that at some point, Omeima had then used that iron to strike him and kill him, stating that it was not self-defence at all because Bill was tied up and that she may have tied him up and then demanded money from him, which he may have refused or he may have started to struggle and then tried to get out of the ties. They also said about how she admitted to police that she had not only cooked parts of Bill's body, but she also said that she had eaten his ribs. 
And she went into graphic detail about this, speaking about how she had actually marinated them in barbecue sauce and they tasted super sweet. Quote, I did his ribs just like in a restaurant. It's so sweet. It's so delicious. I like mine tender. Although she did later change her story again and she just denied this. She said she'd never eaten any of him. But of course we know that not all of his body parts were found. Some of those may have gone in the garbage disposal, but some of them, of course, may have been eaten. Bill's children spoke about how when they had met Omema, they had tried their hardest to get on with her. But to them, although she seemed nice, she did seem as though she genuinely liked their father, they were also uh, simultaneously worried about her motives for marrying him. There was something a little bit off about her and they spoke to one another about the fact that there could be some ulterior motive for the marriage. They knew that Omeima didn't have a lot of money, but their dad did. Omeima was actually acquitted of first degree murder and this was because there wasn't enough evidence to prove that the crime was premeditated, but she was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to life with a minimum of 28 years. Six of those years, she's actually serving for another crime that she was convicted of back, well, it happened in 1990, around one year before the murder, but she was convicted after that and after the murder of Bill. We know that Amema was bouncing from home to home. She was having relationships with various different men. And one of these men, Robert Hansom, had been tied up by Amema and then she'd held a gun to his head. She demanded, with this gun to his head, she demanded that he give her money. And when he said that he just didn't have any, she took off and never saw him again after that. That was, of course, until this trial, which was for uh, false imprisonment and attempted robbery and using a deadly weapon. The tying up and robbing of former partners was something that didn't just happen to Robert. It had allegedly happened to Bill. It had also allegedly happened to a number of other men who Amema had dated. They said that she'd attempted to do the exact same thing to them. Whilst in prison... Amema married a man who was much older than she was. He was actually in his uh, 70s, but he died back in 2011 and Amema came into a good amount of money from his will. Since then, she was denied parole. Uh, that was back in 2011 and her next parole hearing is 2026. Hello, I'm just popping on here quickly to say uh, I'm editing this video back and if you are up to date with the videos and watching them as they come out you'll know that i've not been very well um i'm recording this when i'm still not doing great but i'm not doing badly i'm definitely getting better and i just wanted to uh say such a warm thank you to everyone who has wished me well and hoped for me to get better uh it's really lovely to read all the comments as i'm in bed um just feeling very sorry for myself so i just wanted to pop on and say thanks so much and i hope that you found this video interesting i'm trying to go away from saying i hope you enjoyed this video because i know it's not enjoyable content but i know it is interesting i just had a um, bit of a coughing fit and whilst i was having that coughing fit i was watching the england game and bellingham just scored so um we're only 12 minutes in hopefully that's how the rest of the game goes and we win. Sorry, Serbia. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching this video. And I'll see you next week for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.